an especially exciting uh, guest speaker here, Rick Martin. Uh, he he does men, wears many hats, but the one you are all probably very familiar with is that he wrote the wonderful Wired article about thorium. So uh, I think uh, he's done more than uh, a lot of us could ever hope to do through that uh, through that mighty big speaker box. So. Here you go, Rick. Thank you for coming, man. I really appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks, John. I'm glad I could make it. Um, so uh, my byline is Richard, but you can all call me Rick. And um, a little bit about me, uh, first of all, I'm based in Boulder, Colorado. As John said, I wear many hats, um, including I've been a contributing editor for Wired for going on 10 years, probably eight years or so. I also do some... Uh, energy analysis for Pike Research, which is a small clean tech research firm that's based in Boulder. And um, so you can, uh, the Wired story came out in January and uh, was based on reporting and interviews with a lot of people in this room, particularly Kirk. And the way I came onto the Thorium story is kind of interesting in itself. Um, like I said, I've been covering energy for 20 years. Uh, went to Central Asia back in 97 to cover the Caspian Sea oil boom at a time when most Western journalists couldn't find the Caspian Sea on a map. Um, so I've, I've tromped lot around a lot of oil fields in my life, but obviously uh, seeing renewable as the future. One of the blogs I read is called The Oil Drum, and um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. And I saw a blog by Charles, and what's his last name? Barton. Yeah, Charles Barton. Who has been? Whose father was a chemist, I believe, at Oak Ridge in the '60s. Worked under Alvin Weinberg, who was really the father of thorium research in this country. And so that's how I got interested in it. And uh, a couple of interesting notes about that story. Um, and the URL is here in case you haven't seen it. This presentation will be available on the the uh, Thorium Energy Alliance website after the conference, so you can go find it there. Um, the search engine at wired.com is not always totally reliable. But uh, a couple of interesting notes about that story, one of which was when you, I, I'm a freelancer, and when you pitch a story to Wired, they have a pitch meeting, right? And there's half a dozen to 10 uh, story pitches in any given meeting. And so there's probably six or eight editors in there, and they're pretty, you know, some of the most savvy science and tech editors in the business today. Not a one of them had heard of Thorium except for my editor to whom I presented the pitch. So that'll give you an idea of how new this is to people outside this room and how unaware the sort of mainstream media has been to date about Thorium and its potential. The other thing I'll just say about that story is it's gotten more feedback, both the comments section on the website, which Kirk has been very active in, um, as well as direct emails to me, uh, more feedback than I've gotten probably for all the stories I've written for Wired combined. So again, that'll give you an idea of what this movement is sparking and what uh, you know John and Kirk and the others with the Alliance have, have managed to pull off so far. What I'm gonna do today is just give you a brief news update on developments around um, Thorium, um, particularly around government policy regulation, et cetera. So some of the big events that have happened in the last few months since I sort of completed my reporting for the story itself. One of which is, again, as many of you in this room know, um, the Thorium Energy Independence Act has been reintroduced for at least the third time, right? Um, it's never made it out of committee uh, in past Congresses and it was introduced by Senators Hatch and Reid various provisions to support uh, the development, the R&D around thorium in this country, including setting up an office for thorium fuel cycle research in the DOE, uh, creating a regulatory framework for thorium power generation, which I think is kind of one of those plumbing things that John talked about that's really necessary, it's unglamorous, but we need it if things are gonna move forward. Uh, sort of vaguely, talks about starting demonstration projects for thorium-based reactors and creating, again, unspecified international partnerships for uh, non-proliferation through deployment of thorium-based generation. Um, it's been interesting to watch the 
non-proliferation community, there's kind of a split in that community around between people who are simply anti-nuke across the board, anything having to do with nuclear power generation is bad, we can't have it, and others who are more open-minded, more forward-thinking, and, and who actually do see thorium as a potential path forward for nuclear power without the proliferation issues that uh, uranium-based reactors create. And the bill would provide $250 million in funding over five years starting next year, which by my, uh, you know, from where I sit is a drop in the bucket in this context. Um, and it's not gonna get us anywhere near to, you know, 20 lifters in, in the next uh, 20 years. So uh, we need more, but it is a start. Whether it has a chance in this Congress of passage is anybody's guess. And, and the only the other thing I will say is obviously, uh, Harry Reid and Orrin Hatch are, odd political bedfellows to say the least. And they really came together on this um, through their mutual opposition to Yucca Mountain. And there's also, a, there has been a proposed storage facility in, in Utah as well, and, and Hatch is obviously opposed to that. So uh, it's a rare example of bipartisanship in today's Congress. So <laughs> let's hope there's a chance for it. Um, Meanwhile, of course, the really big news in this country is that the Obama administration has come out strongly in support of nuclear power in general. Um, and there have been a couple of statements, one speech in particular by President Obama. Uh, recently, he's talking about providing $8 billion in loan guarantees for new plants. Um, in the budget request for next year, the DOE would have funding for to support six to nine new reactors, 39 million for small modular reactors, which I'll talk more about in just a minute, and creating a new DOE research center called the Nuclear Energy Modeling and Simulation Hub, um, as well as a blue ribbon commission on America's nuclear future, all of which is kind of a way of saying, let's do this without really putting a lot of political will and, and a lot of support behind it, but simply the fact that a democratic administration has come out very explicitly in support of nuclear power, I think is a huge step for this country. Um, again, how much of that will come to pass is anybody's guess. Uh, the, the permitting process for nuclear plants is really the bottleneck and to get a new plant permitted in this country, it's a decade-long process. And there are private companies going through that process right now, and clearly the industry wants to build new reactors, uranium-based, of course. In the course of reporting the thorium story for Wired, I talked to the CEO of Exelon, which is one of the biggest nuclear power producers in this country, and I asked him about thorium, and he said, well, we're looking at all aspects of the nuclear fuel cycle but we've got uranium, it seems to work, we got a lot of it, so why switch? So that's kind of the attitude of, of what I would call the nuclear power establishment. Um, earlier this month, uh, Energy Secretary Stephen Chu came out with an editorial in the Wall Street Journal in which he even more explicitly supported um, nuclear power, talking about powering six million American homes, creating tens, tens of thousands of jobs in the coming years. Uh, and, and he included this line, which I think is something that most So that's a pretty strong statement coming from the Energy Secretary and, and virtually unprecedented in the last 20 years. He also pointed out that uh, Asian countries like China, South Korea, and India are hard at work on new nuclear power plants as well as new R&D around the fuel cycle. And we, he said we can develop these technologies today or import them tomorrow, which I think is, you can make a similar statement about thorium technology. And again, I'll, I'll return to that in a minute. Um, a lot of what he had to say in this editorial was about small modular reactors. Um, I also spoke to the new president of the American Nuclear Society, and he's kind of made it his mission to bring about um, the advent of smaller modular reactors, basically uh, prefab, you can drop them anywhere. The DOD is very interested in this for obvious reasons. If you've got a base in Mesopotamia that needs power, 
um, you can basically airlift a, a small reactor of the size of maybe a, a container, container. Yeah, a shipping container. Um, and for reasons that I will let the technicians in this audience go more into, thorium is particularly well suited for powering smaller <coughs> modular reactors. And Secretary Chu did talk about, quote, advanced concepts, unquote, that could burn, use fuel, fuel or nuclear waste. He did not mention thorium. And as far as I can tell, the word thorium has never crossed his lips in his tenure so far as energy secretary. Um, he's a really smart guy. He's got a really strong staff. It's hard for me to conceive that they're not aware of the potential of thorium. And again, whether they'll actually come out and, and support it, I think is anybody's guess, but it would be a huge step forward for Secretary Chu to join the already uh, numerous people who have come out in support of thorium. So another piece of news, um, the most recent mineral commodities summary from USGS increased the uh, designated reserves of the US of thorium to 440,000 tons from around 300 or so. I think we were in the last, in last year's list, we were ranked third. And my understanding is that this is based on an increase in the estimation of the reserves at, at Lemai Pass. Is that right, Jim? Right. Yeah. So bottom line is the U.S. by a significant margin now holds the world's largest reserves of, of thorium, which if, if the alliance of the people behind thorium um, can have an effect, is going to become a very strategic mineral over the next 10 to 20 years. So that's a significant change. In their, in their estimation of the reserves. And of course, companies like what used to be Thorium Energy Inc. recently changed their name to Rare Earth something incorporated. Uh, REE, I think. I US that. Rare Earth, I think. Yeah, something like that. Um, they've made a big deal of that. They control the, the reserves at Lemai Pass in Idaho. So that's a significant uh, development. Just a couple of weeks ago, Canada and China signed a pretty far-reaching thorium accord. This was actually an extension of an agreement that was originally signed about two years ago in November of 08. Um, and the original agreement is simply around uh, joint development of advanced nuclear technology. So under this most recent extension, the AECL, the Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, is going to work with a, a few institutes in China, including the the uh, Chinsan <coughs> Nuclear Power Company. That's a picture of uh, Chinshan 3, I believe, at the bottom, to, quote, assess the use of thorium fuel in can-do power reactors. Um, and they are planning within the next few years to demonstrate commercial use of thorium <coughs> in these reactors. Um, one of the AECL executives that was there at the signing was quoted as saying, this is an important step to demonstrate the use of thorium fuel in commercial can-do reactors. And that could happen soon. They're not talking about a 20-year development timeline. Meanwhile, uh, Vladimir Putin traveled to New Delhi, again, just within the last few weeks, met with Prime Minister Singh on uh, energy and defense. And this is an interesting, it, it harks back to the Cold War, right, when um, Russia and, and India were uh, very close and we viewed India as sort of being on the other side of the Cold War divide. Russia said, in addition to selling India a bunch of jet fighters and, and defense technology and weapons, Russia said they're going to build 12 to 16 nuclear plants, six in the next six to seven years, worth tens of billions of dollars. Uh, Russia's already constructing two units in southern India, and it was also specified that Russia will supply India with reactor fuel and help with disposal. Um, in the news accounts in this agreement that I read, there's no mention of specific technology. India has a very uh, ambitious plan for developing thorium reactors. India, as you saw on that list from the USGS earlier, has extensive thorium reserves of its own. 
They're, they call it a, a three-stage development process, which will end with the, will culminate with the building of dozens of thorium-based reactors. And India's uh, officials from India have been very explicit in the last uh, year or so about how India plans to lead the world in thorium-based nuclear power technology and that the rest of the world should pay attention to this. So, and as you, as a lot of you know, Lightbridge is developing their seed and blanket technology at the Kurchatov Institute, which is outside Moscow, and again was sort of the heart of the, the Russian Cold War, the Soviet Cold War uh, weapons in industry. And so now we've got Russia where a lot of the development of U.S.-based technology for thorium is going on, saying that they're going to help India, which controls, you know, is in the top three of thorium reserves and has a very ambitious plan for developing thorium technology. They're working together. Um, so to summarize, I think what you're seeing is is what I talked about in the, in the Wired story, which is that the thorium development of thorium technology is going on whether we participate or not, whether we in the U.S. participate or not. And there are, are several countries that have very specific plans that are moving forward at a, at a relatively rapid pace. So the U.S. is going to have to make a choice whether we're going to be involved in this. And, and again, it goes back to Secretary Chu's <coughs> statement that we can develop these technologies in-house, as it were, or we're going to be importing them uh, in the coming years. And so it, it's really, we're, this, this choice is coming upon us rapidly. We're gonna face uh, a, a turning point here soon. And I think one of the missions of the Alliance and of the people in this room should be to really alert the political leadership of this country what an important choice this is and what the opportunity is. Um, my email is here. Again, this presentation will be available on the Thorium Energy Alliance website. I'd love to communicate with any of you that are interested and um, answer any questions. And I, I hope to be, to continue to follow this story as it unfolds and, and as we really develop a, a thorium based nuclear industry in this country. Thank you. Any questions for Rick? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very interesting uh, speech. I'm coming from Japan. And uh, have you already contact with uh, Japanese political people? Because uh, I think the, the one of the very important features of thorium is the nuclear non-proliferation. And uh, uh, this year, I think, uh, will be the very historical year. And if you have not yet contacted with uh, Japanese political people of the, for example, the uh, Democratic Party, uh, uh, Minister the, uh, Okada is now visiting the United States. If you have a chance, you, you should uh, contact with him and discuss about the story. This is my suggestion. Mm -hmm. And if you have no uh, communication line, please contact me. I will inform you <laughs> how to contact. The answer is no, I have not yet, and I would love to follow up with you. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, do you think our, I, I noticed on the, um, I'm sorry, I don't need to poke you in the eye. Uh, <laughs> that Russia and China have apparently no thorium reserves. Is this a matter of ignorance or a matter of they really don't, as far as we know? Um, sure yeah. <laughs> thorium is everywhere. Everybody's right? got thorium. Yeah, everybody's got a certain amount. I think the USGS is ranking countries in terms of known and developable reserves. Um, China, as Jim will talk about, has a very strong and active rare earths industry, and the thorium is created as a byproduct. And, and I do know that the Chinese, the PRC government has specifically said, it's done what it's been doing with uranium for 20 or 30 years, which is to say all thorium uh, produced as a byproduct of rare earth mining is to be held, kept, not imported, and so on. So the answer is probably they do uh, how much they have is is still unclear, but um, the governments of those countries are very aware of the potential. So I think we'll see them climbing up that.